So the other kind of last assumption I wanted to make as we were thinking about um, how all these things work is we kind of made this assumption that if we took all those little pieces that we had and we said, okay, well, we have these two different things, which of course are our monomers. And we say, well, how can we put these together? Because we know that we kind of saw that they had all these, these different triangles, but it was really, really difficult to do it without actually having to turn one of them upside down. And if we can turn one of them upside down, then they actually can match really, really well. And so that's something you can actually see in this picture right here. And that is that we have one of the molecules kind of goes one way and the other ones are kind of turned upside down. And so that's actually what we refer to as anti-parallel. So they're actually parallel to one another. They're kind of going the, the, they're kind of lined up side by side, but one goes one direction and the other one goes the other direction. So let's talk a little bit about this directionality before we get too far. And so the directionality kind of arises from just the nucleotide itself. And so let's go back to a picture of that. And so of course we already know that there's this nitrogenous base and there's this phosphate group, but for this particular focus we're going to look just at the sugar. And so the sugar, as you can clearly see here with these kind of pink C's, has one, two, three, four, five sugars on it, or five carbons within the sugar rather. And so we can actually count these. And so this first one is here, here's the second, and here's the third, then there's the fourth, and there's the fifth. And so we refer to these by their numbers. And so this one right here is what we call the three prime end or the three prime sugar, whereas the fifth carbon is up here and this is the five prime end of this molecule. And you can see that that actually comes very much so in handy because of the fact that this is the end down here that we mentioned is can actually be attached to another molecule. So there it is, there's the three prime end and it attaches to another nucleotide whereas the five prime end attaches to this phosphate, and of course the phosphate then is able to attach to another nucleotide. But the crux is, is that when you're actually adding new nucleotides to this molecule to make it larger, the only end that you can add to is that three prime end. And so if we look at this side of our um, double helix, you can clearly see that this is our five prime end, there's our phosphate, there's that fifth carbon, and then of course here's our three prime end, because there's our third phosphate, or our third carbon rather. And so the only end that we can actually add things to is this end down here. So this one is actually going to be building down, because that's the only end you can add more nucleotides. Whereas if we look at the other side of this molecule, you can clearly see this is the five prime end, there's the phosphate group. And so in that particular case, it's actually going to build upward. And so as we think about this molecule, it's kind of hard to think about it, but we can think that one side is building that direction and the other side is building that direction. And that is the anti-parallel nature of DNA. So the next thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is, is getting back to the idea of the functionality of DNA. We know that the whole role of DNA is to simply be able to um, take DNA and code for RNA to then be able to make these proteins because we have to somehow store that information to make all the wonderful proteins that is the phenotype that we can see um, on an everyday basis. And so let's kind of make an, an analogy to this whole process. And so we can kind of think of DNA as this original recipe, and we can kind of think of grandma has some Bavarian cream puff recipe. And if you're like me, you have these special recipes from your grandmother that you keep in this special place because you don't want to use them um, every time you make these Bavarian cream puffs because they have a lot of milk and they have eggs and there's baking and there's crazy things going on such that you may actually mess up that original recipe. And if it's your grandmother's, you don't want to do that. And so in some cases, what I'll do is I'll actually write the recipe in my own, own handwriting so that if that gets messed up, I can throw it away and it's not a big deal. But I would rather kind of preserve this original recipe that's in my grandmother's handwriting so that it is maintained and I have it forever. And that's kind of the same thing with DNA, is that DNA is the original recipe and RNA is kind of like my handwriting, so that if something horrible happens along the way, it's not a big deal. I can always make another copy, but I have that original DNA. And then I can then take this RNA, which is again more of this recipe, to then make this protein, if you will, in the end. So let's just take a few minutes to then compare the differences between DNA and RNA because again the whole purpose is really to kind of have this code for all these wonderful things called proteins. So the first kind of similarity or difference we can kind of see is simply looking at the sugar. And so we've already kind of looked, this is the sugar that we already talked about is present in DNA molecules. 
whereas this is actually the sugar that is present in the nucleotides of RNA. And so hopefully you should be looking and saying, wow, these look very, very similar. And really the only difference right here is there's an OH right there, a hydroxyl group, and an H right there. That is really the only difference to make it a ribosugar or a deoxyribosugar. So that's one very similar piece, but of course you can see a difference. In addition, we also know that they also share the exact same phosphate group, but then the next piece that's a little bit different is the bases. And so we can compare over here on this side is RNA. So they both have cytosines, as you can see. They both have guanines that are identical. They both have adenines that are exactly the same. But the real difference is we already saw that, th that thymine existed in DNA, whereas it does not exist in RNA. But the kind of similar piece is what's called uracil. So if you ever see a molecule that looks a lot like DNA, but it has a, a U or a uracil in it, then you know automatically know it actually has to be RNA. So that's one other big difference. Um, another couple differences, as you can hopefully see from this picture, is we've already talked a lot about this double helix structure that we have in DNA. And that, of course, is absolutely true, that we have these kind of two um, kind of long strands that come together. Whereas our, in RNA, it's really only single-stranded. Um, and that really helps in terms of its real functionality. And so now we have this idea that there's these differences between RNA and DNA, but we're really kind of under this impression that the, the functionality of both is to kind of have this storehouse of information to then make protein. So let's talk a little bit about how that works. So as I mentioned, DNA is a double-stranded molecule. So here's one strand, here's the other, and they are kind of come together. But of course, if we want to make more DNA or we want to make RNA from that original coding, we have to unzip it, if you will. And once it's unzipped, then we can go ahead and actually match those things to together and use Chargraff's rule again. And so we know that every C matches with every G. But in this case, every A actually matches with U's because we don't have T's in RNA. And so the other kind of key piece to remember is that directionality that we already saw. Okay, as you remembered, um, you can only add um, nucleotides onto the three prime end, and that's also the case with RNA. And so for making more DNA or more, more RNA, we know that we always synthesize from the five to three direction. But of course, if we're reading, in this case, the template strand, we're actually reading from the three to five direction. And so that's kind of an important thing to remember. Um, and as we look at the DNA molecule, I already introduced the fact that this is called the template because that is actually providing this template from which to actually make more DNA, or in this case, RNA. But the other strand that we can see here is what's called the coding strand. And the coding strand, of course, matches exactly. It's just those opposite. If we have an A here, we have a T here. But the other thing that you should notice is the coding strand has almost the exact same sequence of nucleotides that we actually see in RNA. Of course, the only difference is that every time we see a T in DNA, we see a U in RNA. So now that we have um, used the DNA to make an RNA, that we can make, go to the next step and use the RNA to then make a protein. And of course, a protein, as you already know, um, are made up of monomers, and the monomers are called amino acids. And there's 20 different amino acids. Um, there's a lot of detail here and that you don't need to know, but I just wanted to show you kind of the variability that you could have in all these 20 different amino acids. But the real question is, how do we get from those four nucleotides of RNA to then code into these 20 different amino acids? That translation seems like it may be a little bit difficult going from the four nucleotides of RNA to the 20 different amino acids. So there's a couple ways we can think about doing this. So the first thing is to say, well, what if we just assume that there's only one nucleotide that then is able to translate into one amino acid? Well, as you can clearly see, we would run short. There's a whole bunch of amino acids that don't have a code. And if we were to kind of just make it redundant and have uracil also code for isoleucine, then we would have no way to dis determine when you have a U, which one does it actually code for. So clearly, having this one nucleotide translation doesn't work to kind of say, well, if we only have one nucleotide to then code for 20 amino acids, we have way too many amino acids that have no real unique code. So we could shift the model and say, well, what about if instead we actually have two nucleotides in a row that are our translation between these two sides? 
We could then make a list of all the possible different nucleotide translations. So we could have CC, CG, CA, CU, of course, because it is RNA, and then kind of all of these different variations. And if we match these up, we can again see that we fall short near the bottom again. Um, and so this two nucleotide translation is almost enough, but it's really not quite enough. And so we then have to shift to thinking, well, what if instead the, the kind of go-between of the four nucleotides and the 20 amino acids is three nucleotides to kind of code for each thing? And that's exactly the perfect combination. And folks kind of have, scientists have figured out that this is exactly how it works, is there's these three nucleotides, like you can see here, you can have C, C, U, and that then codes for proline. You're probably also noticing that there's some redundancy because it's not just CCU that codes for proline, but it's also CCG that codes for proline. And that redundancy is actually okay, and it's actually a benefit, because if there happened to be some mutation, say, in this last base of the sequence, then it wouldn't really be a big deal because it would still code for proline. And so those three nucleotides then that are this translation between, or this kind of go-between between RNA and amino acids is actually what we refer to as a codon. And so a codon is simply just the three nucleotides that then code for some amino acid. The couple codons that I did want to highlight um, before we move on is these ones down here, this one right here, and the sequence of AUG in terms of nucleotides actually does code for methionine, which is an amino acid. But the other important thing that it does is it actually starts this process of translation so that after you've made this RNA and it has all these sequences of nucleotides, it's not until it reaches this particular codon, this AUG, that it actually starts making a protein. And so that's a very, very important piece. And as you can clearly see, they're always gonna start with methionine. The other ones that I wanted to point out, of course, are these ones that code for stops, okay? And there's three different variations that do that. The other important thing besides them actually stopping the translation, meaning that, that it, it truncates and it, and it ends the um, kind of production of that protein, is that there actually is no amino acid that is coded for by UAA or UGA or UAG. And that is they just stop it. They don't actually code for an amino acid. And that's important as we think about um, how many amino acids are, are in a sequence. So now I'd like you to go ahead and watch a video that describes actually how to use this translation table so that you can come out with um, a sequence of RNA and figure out what the codons are. And from those codons, you can actually be able to identify the subsequent amino acids that would come out of that. So go ahead and watch that um, video for the last part of this lesson.